Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Uh, well, good morning, Summit. How are you? How about a little winter? I mean, uh, fall, amen? Uh, got a little cool this week. It's going to get hot again this week, so enjoy it while you can, and then it'll cool off again, and then it'll get hot again, and about January, we'll have winter, and uh, that's kind of the way it works around here. So uh, we're in this series called Hello, My Name is God, and we're looking at the names of God, and a uh, little boy was in school drawing a picture, and his teacher was walking around looking at the pictures and looking at all the stuff the kids were looking at and uh, drawing, and she came across this little boy, and he was intently drawing. In fact, he had his arms up around the picture because he didn't want anybody to see the picture and the teacher kept walking by and then finally the teacher comes walks by and she asked the little boy said what are you drawing and he looked up at her and said I'm drawing a picture of God she goes well you can't do that because nobody knows what God looks like little boy looked up at her and said they will when I'm done (laughs) amen they will when I'm done I guarantee you And you know, that's funny because all of us have a picture of God, don't we? We all have this idea of what God would look like. And and if I was to hand out a sheet of paper to every one of you in this room today and said, listen, I want you to draw your best picture of God. Some of you would draw the stick figure because you're not very inclined to artistic, right? And others of you would have this massive, beautiful artwork and you'd be asking for more paper. And because all of us have this idea of what God looks like. And the problem is so many of us would, what we would draw, all of us, what we would draw would be be inadequate. I, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now, and, and I remember back in the 80s when, when they, this picture of Jesus came out, and it wasn't the, the Catholic Jesus knocking at the door. It was Jesus in blue jeans rolled up a little bit with a white t-shirt on and with long hair, because Jesus always had long hair, and, and, it, and it always says, Jesus is my homeboy. So inadequate of what God is, right? Because we all have this picture of God in our mind. In fact, in the Old Testament, God prohibited his people from drawing or carving any images of him because we we have a tendency to misrepresent him. We have a tendency to bring God down to our image and not, we we never reach up to his image. We're always bringing him down and God doesn't bring himself down to our rendition of him. We always have to rise up to his image of who he is because God desires his people to be holy and to be completely different than all the pagan neighbors because all the pagan neighbors in Jesus and, and God's in the Israelites day, they would carve their images of their gods and one wasn't enough so they had to carve another one and that one wasn't enough so they created another one and that one wasn't enough so they created another one and God said, no, I want to set you apart. I want you to be different and holy. And so these last couple of weeks, we've been looking at these foundational names of God because these foundational names of God set up the next seven weeks, and we're going to be looking at the seven redemptive names of God. And the reason this is so important for us to understand these three foundational names of God, because everything comes out once we understand these three foundational names, everything else we begin to understand in, in almost clarity of who God is. And so the first week we looked at Elohim. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, the creator, God, the strong one. And we love that because what kind of God would he be if he wasn't strong, right? I mean, what kind of God would he be if he didn't create, right? So we learn from the very first thing when God said, hello, I am God. He wanted us to understand that you, I am the creator God. I created all this. I created everything that you see. In fact, I existed before anything you see existed. And then last week, Jake introduced Jehovah, the self-revealing one. That he wants to make himself known to us. And that we want to know Elohim as also as Jehovah. Because we want to know that that all-powerful creator God is actually talking to us and coming after us and pursuing us of what Andrew was just saying. 
You see, the devil just wants us to have religion, to serve a strong God. And then what we're going to look at today, the, in Adonai, the owner of God, the owner of everything, and he wants us to leave out the Jehovah God that he's a relational God because if he's a strong God over here and he owns everything over here and we leave out the Jehovah and we become a religious people bound in religion because he's a controlling creator God. And the biggest thing that people struggle with and not understanding who God is, is he's Jehovah. He's the one that pursues us and wants to be in a relationship with us. And the moment you bring Jehovah you gotta to relate to the true God. And when we understand God in that state, that he is a strong creator God, and as today as we're gonna to look at, he owns everything. Jehovah sits right in the middle, that that strong creator God that owns everything wants to be in relationship with us. And it's a beautiful picture, and out of those three pictures, everything else about him begins to make sense. See, that third name of God, the foundational name of God is Adonai. It reveals God as the owner of everything. If he created everything and he wants to be in relationship with us, then he owns everything. It's found over 400 times in the scripture and its meaning is interesting because it's a singular word which translated master or ruler. It contains the aspect of dominion or rulership and ownership. Adonai means he owns everything, including us. I know. And that's where the rub is, isn't it? <laughs> that's where the rub comes in because we don't mind him owning everything out there and we don't mind him even owning the one next to us, but me? Yeah. In fact, Psalms 50, verses 10 through 12, look at it. It says, for all the animals of the forest are mine and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for all the world is mine and everything in it. Isn't that good? I love that statement. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you because I'm God. I own it all. If I, and even if I had to eat, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother you with that because everything I have is mine. In Psalms 97, five, that he is the holy creator. He is the Lord of all the earth. That word uh, Adonai means to own or be the master. The biblical picture that we see all through scripture is this one of ownership. It has this background of a, of a slave or slaves that not only were he, are we owned, but we're also, not only does he own us, he also bears a responsibility for what he owns. So God takes care of the earth and we like that. God takes care of all the things that he's created. We're glad that God keeps the planets in alignment, are we not? We're glad that all the galaxies have their place. But listen, that's because he created them. He has ownership of them. Well, the same is true for us that he provides for, protects, and he guides. So what he owns, he takes responsibility for. And that means the slave had somebody, if he was a, a good Adonai on the human level, that that slave in that picture of the Old Testament and New Testament, that slave had, 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 was taken care of because he had a good Adonai. He had a good master. He had a good owner. And so the slave could rest in that the owner was going to bear the responsibility of taking care of him. In the New Testament, uh, you, when you read the scriptures, in, in, uh, the apostles would call themselves often bond servants or bond slaves of Jesus Christ, even to the point of saying, I am in chains for Christ. And today, all these thousands of years later, and especially in a third world free country, we, we hear those terms and we're almost offended by them because slavery is such a dark thing. But yet these men in the New Testament were so captivated by, by, by the Elohim and by Jehovah that they were willing to say, you know what? I am in chains for Jesus. I'm a bond servant. In fact, the apostle Paul acknowledged that the entire earth belongs to Adonai. He says, for the earth is the Lord's and everything is, it. and the good news is he owns everything, so therefore he takes care of it. When we submit to Adonai as the owner of our lives and everything we have, there's a great peace in realizing that if he owns us, he'll take care of us. That's the beautiful picture of Jehovah being our master. See, it would have been almost backwards for us to introduce Adonai first because we have to understand that he's a strong creator God who wants to relate with us. 
But because he's the Adonai, he takes care of us when we're submitted to the master. You know, we see pictures in the Old Testament of men who struggled with this. Because see, we're not the first to struggle with this because what we're talking about today is lordship. What we're talking about today is being owned. And can I just be honest with you? I was in, in the, uh, this morning brushing my teeth and, and I was thinking, you know, nobody likes to be owned, do they? Especially in America. We're, we're Americans. We're, we're, we're in the Western world. Don't tell me what to do. Don't own me. Don't, don't come in and crowd me, bro. Get out of my space. You're in, you're kind of in close. And we pride ourselves in that, don't we? We pride ourselves that no man owns me. I am free. And yet we don't even understand what freedom really means. Because freedom is not having no one over you. Freedom is being under authority. Freedom is being under the good master so that then we may do what the master tells us. You, know, you look in the Old Testament, you find several examples. The first one is in Abraham and Sarah. And the first use of Adonai is found in Genesis chapter 15, verses one and two. It's that story of Abram. And let's look at it together. In verses one and two, it says, sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Adam replied, oh, sovereign Lord, what good are your blessings when I don't even have a son? See, the Lord had promised Abraham he was gonna have a son and Abraham was about 90 years old when God promised him. And Abraham was like, are you crazy? Are you crazy? Anybody 90 years old in here today that wanted to admit it? 80, 70, 60, is there a 50-year-old right now that if God came to them and said, you're going to be pregnant, you'd be excited about that? I mean, really? 40? Okay, well, I'll stop there because I know some of you guys are like, yeah, I'll take four more. Anyway, God bless you. Um, <laughs> but Abraham replied, oh, sovereign Lord, what good are your blessings when I don't even have a son? Because see, God promised him and then a decade later, he still didn't have a son. Since you've given me no children, my servant and my household will inherit all my wealth. You see, God was promising me, you're gonna be a great nation. Abraham was looking at me, oh, God, that's kind of hard to do because I don't have any kids. Sarah's old. Sarah is dried up, I think is the word he used. Not a flattering picture of your bride, amen? I mean, how many ladies in the room want my husband? Hey, I'm dried up. Love scripture, yo. I mean, some people think it's boring and you read something like that and go, dude, I, I'm sure that guy even lived past that point, right? I'm sure she didn't kill him in his sleep right there. She's dried up, God, and, and hey, have you checked me out lately? God said, I'm gonna make you a great nation. And 10 years goes by. Now, I want you to notice the different uses of the word. In verse one, it's written in all caps, meaning Yahweh, Jehovah. That there is a God relating to him in relationship. And then in verse two, only the L is capitalized because the Hebrew word is Adonai. In other words, God said, I'm responsible for you. I'm responsible for you. I am responsible to take care of you and accomplish what I told you I was gonna accomplish. And I know it's been 10 years. I know that you're looking at that. And Abraham heard what God had said when he revealed himself and his plan, but Abraham had not yet seen the fulfillment. And so he appealed to God's character in verse two. He said, you're the master. You're my owner. You're the one that I submit to. Where are you? You see, some of you are right there. Some of you are in your walk with God and you're, you've been praying and God gave you something years ago and you've been hanging on to it and you're beginning to doubt. You see, Abraham had to trust that Adonai, the owner, that responsible one, could fulfill the promise. But we're Americans, aren't we? We don't wait for anything. We, don't, we get upset if McDonald's is more than three minutes, right? I mean, it's not brain surgery, it's a burger, but we're Americans. You see, God promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation in a decade. 10 years later, the aging Abraham still didn't have any children. And even though Abraham trusted God's promise, he didn't understand his timing. Abraham and Sarah were both way beyond childbearing years. But Adonai reaffirmed his promise and Abraham look at verses four and six of Genesis 15. Then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir for you will have a son of your own who will, bear, who will be your heir. And then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up in the sky, count the stars if you can, son, because that's how many descendants you'll have. 
And Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. See, Abraham believed him. And as a result of his faith, God considered Abraham righteous. It would have been so much easier to bring Isaac along 10 years earlier, wouldn't it? I mean, it would have still been just as big of a miracle. I mean, they were both old when God made the promise, weren't they? And God could have very easily said, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, a descendant that outnumber the stars and, and Sarah will wake up the next morning and be pregnant. Now, God waited 10 years. You see, often we see God delay carrying out his promises in the Old Testament until he sees a heart of surrender and submission. Oftentimes we see God delay what he's doing because he's looking for a heart of surrender, of submission. And see, we don't like that side, do we? We very much want a creator, savior. We just don't want a Lord. And yet we see that over and over again, submission to God as absolute ruler and master can affect the timing of the promises in your life. And we don't like to hear that. But yet we know that, don't we? We who are parents who have children, I mean, how foolish would it be for us to give a brand new Camaro to one of our children who is obstinate and rebellious over and over again, and yet then we reward their obstinance and their rebellion with a brand new Camaro. How foolish would that be? Yet we see it every day, don't we? But we as parents understand that. And God goes, no. Skip to verse 18 of chapter 15. We see God makes a covenant, a relational act tied to love. It's an intimate picture. It says, so the Lord made a covenant with Abraham that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants. Now listen to me, submission is powerful. Unfortunately, too many of us have settled for Jehovah without experiencing Adonai. So many of us love the relational God But we don't understand that being in relationship with him means submission to him. Means that he is Lord, he's the owner, he owns it all. And I believe to experience all that God can do as our ruler and master and owner of our life, then he gets to call the shots. He gets the final say in your relationships if you're single. He gets the final say in your relationships in high school. He gets the final say in your career and your decisions and your finances and your choice and your time. And many of us want all-powerful God Elohim, and we want a relational God Jehovah, but few of us give them the right to own us. I'm telling you, it's a hard word. And God must have the right to own us if we're going to take, if he's going to take responsibility to do something in your life. I don't know of a business owner on earth who would invest their money into something they cannot control. Amen. See, when we surrender to Adonai, there's nothing he can accomplish. And then there's this guy named Moses. Y'all remember him? Remember Moses? He was that guy that grew up in Egypt and, and, and left Egypt. And then God called him and said, you're going to go back to Egypt and you're going to free my people. And Moses went, God, I can't. Y'all remember that guy? In Exodus chapter four, verses 10 through 13, look what happens. It says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, Jehovah. He's on a relationship here. He's going, look, we have a relationship here. There's... Oh, Lord, I don't know. I'm not very good with words, and I never have been. And I'm not now, and even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. And then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Elohim. Who decides whether people speak or do not speak or hear or do not hear and see or do not see? Elohim. Is it not I, Lord of Jehovah? Now go, and I'll be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what you say. But Moses again, Lord, Adonai, please send anyone else. You see, at the end of the day, Moses trusted Adonai to equip him to carry out the task. He was insecure. He felt inadequate to go and face Pharaoh. But at the end of the day, he, applied, he appealed to Adonai, you own me. I belong to you. And Adonai had promised to say, son, I created your mouth. I can make it work. I created you. I can make that work. You trust me and you go and I am going to take responsibility for you. You see, when God's your Adonai, 
and you submit to him. Full control. He can use you in ways that will just stupefy people around you. It's amazing to me that he can give you supernatural ability to do what you can't do naturally. He did it for Abraham. He did it for Moses. That Adonai is sovereign and his will reigns. He's the owner and responsible one. Still not convinced? Remember that guy named Gideon? That guy Gideon in the Old Testament, we hear a lot about Gideon, and I love the story of Gideon because Gideon and the people, the Israelites, they were being pounded by the Midianites, the enemy. They were being pounded, man, and they cried out to God, Jehovah, God, come on, you gotta help us. So God comes to them, and we've all been there, hadn't we? Beat down, crying out. So God told Gideon, you're gonna go defeat Midian. But Gideon doubted. Look at Judges 6, 15 through 16. It says, but the Lord Adonai Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I'm the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. In other words, here's what Gideon's saying. Lord, I don't qualify. In fact, I have the weakest family. I don't have an education. I don't have a college degree. I don't have a pedigree. I don't come from a war and family. And you're calling me? <laughs> Judges chapter seven, God whittled his army down from 30,000 to 300. Now, if that doesn't make you shake in your boots, I don't know what will, because you're fighting the Midianites. And what you know, the rest of the story is that Gideon goes out and destroys the Midianites and does exactly what the master told him to do, but Gideon had to submit. Can you imagine whittling your army down from 30,000? See, some of us want the power of God without the surrender to God. Some of us just want to acknowledge God without surrendering to him. Scripture tells us that when we came into the world, we came in with nothing, and we're gonna leave with nothing. I do a lot of funerals. In fact, I do more funerals than I'm comfortable with on some weeks and some days. But here's what I know about funerals is they don't leave with anything. And here's what I know about birth because I've seen three of them, amen, up close, firsthand. They're born naked. Isn't that amazing? I know, I said naked in church, amen. See, we know that's true, don't we? Everything we have on earth is on loan. We're just merely borrowers of God's resources. And by the way, everything you collected, your kids are gonna spend. Just, just rest on that a minute, okay? That precious truck of yours. When you die, your kids are gonna burn rubber in it, okay? That white carpet you have in the house, they're gonna track mud on it when you're gone. It's amazing what happens. And by the way, they're gonna sell the dream home. Oh, I know. That's why we're gonna destroy everything before our kids get it, amen? It's gonna tear it all up, man. Burn the tires off the truck and the Jeep. I mean, come on now. See, here's the rub. Here's the problem. We know we're borrowing it, don't we? We know that we can't take it with us. We know that. And yet, the problem is too many of us wanna use God's name and what he's made without acknowledging the ownership of all that he's made, including us. In fact, I taught this Wednesday night at our youth service that if you're a believer, and I'm talking to believers in here, I'm talking to you guys that claim to follow Jesus, that claim to follow God, that claim to have surrendered to Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? And I love this next statement, look at it. You don't belong to yourself. Why? Because God bought you. bought you with a high price. It's Jesus. So for you and me that claim to know Jesus, maybe you walked an aisle when you were growing up. Maybe you prayed a prayer in your bedroom. Maybe your boss led you to Christ. Well, guess what? You don't belong to you anymore. You don't call the shots. God has the right to all of you, your spirit, your soul, your body. And unless God, Adonai, owns all of you, you won't be able to experience all of him. That's why some of you struggle. 
Because surrender is the key to God revealing and unveiling Jehovah in your life. To surrender. Do you know the New Testament talks about the word to submit to one another? Because there's power in submission. There's power when a man and a wife submit to one another. It brings an intimacy of Jehovah in your journey that I can't even begin to explain. You just have to experience it. Because there's power there. You see, Jesus framed it this way in Luke 6, 46. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you just don't do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? What an incredible statement. You see, acknowledging God and surrendering to God as Adonai are two totally different things. Adonai comes with obedience. Adonai comes with obedience. It comes with sacrifice. Adonai comes with a heart that follows what God says and recognizes him as the owner who calls the shots. See, everyone who believes in God and recognizes his creatorship, but many just don't submit to his lordship. It's like when a cowboy goes and buys a horse and he brings that horse home that he now owns and he puts him in a pen, but he wants so much more for that horse. And so he goes out every day and he gets on the back of that horse to call, to do what we call breaking the horse. And every day that he goes out there, that horse does one thing. He doesn't want anybody owning him. He doesn't want anybody controlling him. And so the moment the cowboy gets on, he bucks the cowboy off. And you know what the cowboy does because he owns the horse. He gets right back on him. And he continues to ride that horse and that horse continues to buck him until the horse submits. And you see, here's what happens when the horse submits. The horse then gets to experience all the master wants him to experience. But none of us love to be owned, do we? You see, many of us can't hear a word from God because every time God wants to get on our back, we try to buck him off. And every time God comes to us, we want to hold the reins of our life. I got it, I got it. I was reading back in our children's ministry those books that our children's pastor has up on the wall about raising a fourth grader and a fifth grader and their famous words are, I got it. I got it. And I, I stood there Wednesday night before I was going to speak to you guys. So Wednesday night, I was looking at that book going because I'm thinking, that's my life right now. My son, I've got it. Dad, I got it. Close the door, Dad, I got it. Dad, I got it. Dad, I got it. And in that moment, standing there, I realized so many times I look at God and go, I got it. And you know what Jehovah does? Okay. How about it? Until we address the Lordship Adonai in our lives, I believe God's revelation to us and his use of us will be limited. And we won't see us go into those deeper levels that God won't. See, Jesus is the Adonai. Or in the Greek, the kuros, the Lord, the master. He revealed himself to Paul as the Adonai on the Damascus Road. As that when he took complete control of Paul's life, when Paul submitted to Jesus as Adonai. As we read the opening of this message, the apostles and the followers of Jesus in the New Testament called Jesus their master. That we are bondservants of Jesus Christ. And that term bondservant in the New Testament in some translations mean, means a voluntary service to others. In most cases, it's a term referred to a person in a permanent role of service that a bond servant was considered the property of another, holding no right to leave his place of service. You see, when, when Peter and James and, and, and Paul and those guys, Jude, claimed to be bond servants of Jesus Christ, that what they were saying is, I can't leave. I don't want to leave, but I can't leave because I belong to Jesus Christ. 15 years ago, I was in Grand Lake, Colorado, my sweetheart, which by the way, if you're visiting the lady on the keyboard that called me hot, that's my wife, okay? So I don't want you to think that's a creepy church, all right? I was thinking about that a while ago. There's visitors in the room going, wow, that's kind of weird. They call their pastor hot. That's, um, it's my wife, or cute. I, I heard hot, babe. Anyway, um, <laughs> we were in Grand Lake and Livy, our oldest, was six months old. And everywhere we travel, I always bought rings and uh, came across this ring and I thought it was so cool because it, it reminded me of a chain. 
So I bought it and I wore it for a few years. And I remember studying this passage and coming across that I'm in chains for Christ. And I thought, gosh, every time I look at that ring, it reminds me of that. And it so impacted me that a few years later, I went and put it in a place that every time I look at myself, I realize I'm not my own. And I know some of you don't like tats and all that good stuff, but just, just go with This is my story, okay? Every time I see that, I'm reminded that I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That can never be removed. And I don't want it removed because every time I look at that, I'm reminded that I am not my own. I don't call the shots. I don't get that privilege anymore because I now belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was bought with a price because God loved me and he knew my sin separated me from him. And so he did the most incredible Jehovah act he could do and he sent Jesus Christ to die for me, to take my place of what I deserved. And three days later, he rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave. That if I would just believe on him and surrender Adonai to him, that I would be saved. And on January the 31st, 1986, I did that. I surrendered my life to him. Now, I've not been perfect, don't hear me. Okay, I've struggled. I've had those moments of doubt like Gideon. I've had those moments of doubt like Abraham. I've had those moments of doubt like Moses. But I'm reminded every day that I am not my own. I am now in chains to Jesus. See, here's the good news. When we acknowledge God as our creator, our Elohim, our relator, our Jehovah, and we surrender to Adonai, the owner of us. We're his slave. We get the delivering power of Jesus Christ now. Not out there somewhere, but now. Because he owns us. And he's going to fulfill what he started. Now listen to me. I want you to keep this in mind. The slave or the bond servant is simply to do whatever the master says. All right, let me say that again. The only responsibility of the doulas, the slave, the bond servant of Jesus Christ is to do whatever the master says. No questions asked. Does that crawl over you like it does me? Come on, be honest. So I know we're in church, right? Because there's still something in us that says, I'm mine. No, listen to me. You were bought with a price, a very high price. And so surrendering him to Lord, it's more than believing. It's about surrender. Jake said it last week, the demons believe. It's more about believing it's about surrender, aligning ourselves under the lordship of Christ. And that simply means when we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ, it doesn't change what we say, it changes what we do. That the actions behind it. See, the less you are a slave to Jesus, the more bound you are to illegitimate strongholds. Freedom comes as we surrender to him. Freedom comes as we surrender to him. Let me say that again. Freedom comes as we surrender to him. And listen, some of you are scared to death. If I surrender to him, then this. If I surrender to him, then that. And if I surrender to him, then those. Well, let me ask you a question. If I brought Bill Gates up here on the stage today and to introduced him that he was willing to take on your money and he's gonna invest all your money for the rest of your life and if he loses it, guess what? He's got enough to cover it. That all you have to do is go, Bill, Melinda, here. I'd give him about $20, right? Amen? You can laugh about that. That's uncomfortable, okay? Bill, 
make 20 bucks. Everyone, we would be lining up. Bill Gates is going to, Bill Gates is going to, and if he loses, he's going to, and if there's not enough, he'll make it up. Holy cow. Why? Because we know Bill Gates' track record, don't we? We've watched his investments. We've watched what he does. And we would line up for a guy like Bill Gates to take all of our money, to take that retirement fund that some of you are sitting on, to take that future retirement that you're starting next month, right? Next month never comes. And that you're going to start that and you're going to give it to Bill and Bill's going to take care of it. Listen, the reason some of you are scared to death, you wouldn't hesitate to give Bill Gates anything because you know his track record. The reason some of you do not want to surrender to God is because you don't know him. You claim to know him. You know enough to know he's creator. You know enough to know that he's pursuing you. But when it comes to surrender, man, you don't trust him. It's harsh, isn't it? But the reality is that's why we must get to know him. Danielle and I were sitting on the back porch last night and, and she looked at me and goes, you didn't know that about me, did you? And I was like, no, I didn't. 20 years, man, we've been together. And every day I learn something different about her. Every week I learn something deeper about her. You see, that's why it's important that we know the character of God and who he is. The reason so many of us buck obedience and surrender is because we don't know him. We know the God of the Baptist. We may know the God of the Presbyterians or the Church of Christ or maybe the God of the Methodist. Maybe you know the God of your mama or your daddy or your granddaddy or your grandmama. Well, I just ask, honestly, no. Do you know the Elohim, Jehovah, and the Adonai? You see, confessing Adonai requires action. Abraham, Moses, Gideon, they had to do something to demonstrate their trust and their surrender to God. And they weren't comfortable I mean, Abraham wasn't comfortable trusting God for a son at 90 years old. Hello? How about old Moses going to go back to Pharaoh, the guy, his brother that he's got to go confront, man? How about Gideon sending nearly all of his soldiers home? Yet despite their discomfort, they did what God said because they not only called him Adonai, but they surrendered to his will. Can I just say this to you as we close today? When you and I don't surrender to Adonai, we surrender to chaos. When you and I don't surrender to Adonai, we surrender to chaos. And listen, chaos is a broad statement. Some of you are on this end of chaos and it's manageable. And others of you are way over here and it's so far out of control. Either way, it's chaos. Either way, it's chaos. That's why so many problems appear in our lives. We seek our own way and our own will, yet when we surrender to Adonai, we surrender to fulfillment and freedom because he's got this to throw up that white flag of surrender. I'm done. I'm done. I give up. I'm yours. So God, whatever you want to do, you do it. He's the Adonai. He created you. He pursued you. And he bears the responsibility to accomplish what he set out to accomplish in you. Amen? You believe that? Would you be willing to wave that white flag this morning? For some of you, that means you need to get saved. Some of you, you need to get saved. You need to confess that he is the Lord Jesus Christ and you are his dullest, you are his slave. And surrender to him and let him forgive you and save you. For others of us, we, we're like that bucking horse. Every time guys, and there's just that one area for some of you. And you just continue to buck God. And I don't know what that area is. You fill in the blank, you do. Because that's what kept you up last night. That's what bothers you week in, week out because you keep bucking him. And maybe it's just time to surrender, to give that to him. And every time he climbs up on your back (laughs) to break you, because he loves you. He's not breaking you because he hates you or he's mad at you. He has so much more for you. And so he's going to crawl back up on. And every time you buck him, surrender. Every time you buck him, surrender. 
Every time you buck him, surrender. Freedom comes in surrendering. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, that we can dig in your word and see men and women who really struggle. But God, at the end of the day, they surrender to you. As the Adonai, as the one who bears responsibility for us. And so God, I pray for the one in this room this morning that may not know you, may have never surrendered their life to you. Father, would you give them the courage today to surrender? In just a moment, Lord, when we uh, stand and we respond, I pray you give them courage to step out and maybe come and grab one of these prayer warriors by the hand and just, Father, admit they need you. They need Jesus. Father, for others of us, there's some things in our life that before we ever go take communion, God, we need to surrender. God, we need to get this right before you. So God, would you give us courage today to move from chaos to peace, to be in that bond servant. Where are we gonna go? You have life. So God, help us surrender. Give us courage to surrender. I love you. And we ask these things in that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you. I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.